I know what you're thinking. What is this penis doing on stage? <laughs> My name is Desh Miller. I'm the founder of This Is 42, and also thinking, I'm also a filmmaker. That doesn't really answer your question. Let me tell you a story. I've been organizing events like this around Australia and New Zealand for well over a decade. And we always put a lot of thought behind these events, and we always think ahead who's going to host these events. And we normally have a, quite a list. So when the time came, I put the word out. I sent out an email to a well-known journalist. It took her 10 minutes. She responded saying, no thanks. Unusual. Sent another email to another journalist. Now she took half an hour. She came back saying, I would like to politely decline. I re reached out to a few more people. One of them did the polite thing and said, hey, I'm really busy right now. I'll get back to you. I'm still waiting. <laughs> and the next person didn't respond. And the next person. You can see what's happening. For some reason, no self-proclaimed feminists wanted to host this event. Actually, nobody wanted to host this event. So as an immigrant, I'm doing the job that nobody wants to do. <laughs> I will be the first to admit, I do not have an encyclopedic knowledge about the subject matter. But I am a curious mind. I want to learn. <sighs> Jokes aside, I know what happens when we do not engage in difficult conversation, when we do not speak to groups of people we disagree with. See, I was born into a country of civil war. I've only known my country, Sri Lanka, as a country of war. I've seen things that nobody should see. And when the war finished, I went back and did some reconciliation work. And one thing we learned, 70% of my countrymen did not have a friend or engage in meaningful conversation with the other. When you otherize a group of people, it's easy to hate. Or 100,000 of my people died. I know it's a very serious note, but I'm simply suggesting that we need to engage in better conversation. And for thousands of years, Wurundjeri people of Kulin Nation, the custodians of this land, have had meaningful conversations. And with their blessing and yours, I would like to attempt to facilitate such a conversation. Sound good? Okay. So please... Uh, help me welcome our first guest. She's an award-winning American author, a philosopher, a university professor, and a scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. Please give a warm welcome to Christina Hoff Summers. Hello. Hello. She's a multiple award-winning author, New York Times best-selling author, also a professor, a cultural critic, and you all know uh, also as a Twitter aficionado. <laughs> Sydney, please give a warm welcome and let her know we appreciate her being here today with us. Roxanne Gay. I, 
I think it's fair to say, Roxanne, you have a few fans. I do. I do indeed. Thank you for coming out, Sydney. So, first and foremost, thank you so much for coming all the way over here to have this conversation. Um, so this all started uh, about a, uh, probably about eight months ago. I was having a conversation with a group of people about geopolitics and random stuff, and somehow feminism came up, and I mentioned I'm a feminist. And the energy in the room changed. Something I've said has just startled everybody. See, I understand the dictionary definition of the word and the meaning of feminism, but somehow the societal meaning may have changed and I didn't get the memo. So I also looked up that in the US and the UK, polling data suggests that only one in five young women identify themselves as feminist. So the obvious question, Roxanne, I want to start off with you. Um, how do you define feminism? Uh, is it just equality or something broader and more subversive? And how far can one define feminism for themselves? Uh, you know, I get asked that question a lot and I no longer answer that question because <laughs> it's Great 2019. Start. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's 2019 and if you don't know what feminism is at this point, you are being willfully ignorant and you're not interested. But the reality is that this very basic idea that women and men are equal and that we need to consider the ways in which women need to be, ha need to have their concerns addressed is a very real one. And unfortunately, people don't take it seriously. And they say, oh, we don't need feminism because things are fine, at least in the Western world, as if mediocrity is an acceptable thing for women. Uh, and I disagree. And so people are really hesitant to consider themselves feminists because there's such a stigma around it that if you're a feminist, you're a troublemaker or you are an unpleasant person, you're angry and you're man-hating, which are, you know, these are all entirely reasonable ways to be. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what's the problem here? Uh, you know, there's a lot going on. Um, Christina, is your feminism Roxanne's feminism? <laughs> uh, that remains to be. <laughs> Can I just say one thing uh, about, when I came in, you had a picture of me, like, was that my high school photograph? <laughs> I just wonder where you got it. I, I don't know. <laughs> Different color hair, I don't know what happened. But anyway. Um, as a woman of a certain age, um, age enhanced, um, actually, u.gov does a poll every other year and asks people, are you a feminist? And it's a fairly low number. About 25, sometimes 30 percent will say yes, and the rest do not accept the designation. This can be very frustrating in feminists because if you ask the same people, do you believe in equality of the sexes, then you get, you know, high 90s saying yes. So these pollsters actually asked, why don't you identify as a feminist? And the number two answers given were that um, feminists today are too extreme or th that today's feminism doesn't represent the women's movement at its best. And I can see why a lot of people get that idea. I think that there is an, ex I think there are many kinds of feminism. I've always been an equity, equality feminist, but I think in, particularly on social media and in the media in general, you do get a kind of um, extreme version that's just alienating to a lot of women. And it might be fun for those who are ferocious and angry, and but, you're leaving a lot of women behind that could be part of a movement. Your last uh, book is Not That Bad, Dispatches from Rape Culture. Uh, what do you mean by rape culture? You know, rape culture can mean a lot of different things, and that was actually what I was trying to understand and define with the anthology when I initially proposed that I wanted to solicit cultural criticism about what does it mean to live in a world where the phrase rape culture exists. But in general, it, it means that we live in a world where oftentimes women believe that it's a question of when rather than if they're going to deal with some form of sexual violence. It's a world where 
women have to worry about their personal safety in ways that really are unfair because we should be able to have the same kinds of bodily autonomy that men do. And so the anthology was supposed to look at that, but I opened up submissions and received 330 submissions, and of those, 300 of them were testimony. And I realized, oh my goodness, we're not in a place where we can engage in thoughtful cultural criticism yet because people still need to write their sort of stories about what they've been through. And this was before the Me Too hashtag that I um, opened up submissions and started soliciting content. And in the end, we did put together a very thoughtful book uh, engaging with this idea of rape culture, but it was not the book I originally intended. Christine, I want to ask you this question. Uh, this is from Madonna's 1989 video, Like a Prayer. Uh, it famously uh, features a burning cross, black Jesus, and it led uh, the Pope to ban her from performing in Italy. My question is, in, in today's world, if a female musician uh, were to do something as provocative as that, but instead of using Christianity, she used any other religion, do you think she will be champion like Madonna, or do you think she would be considered uh, to be potentially a bigot or being in culturally insensitive? Oh, well, are you saying that if she like burnt a hijab or something? Or... Oh, well, it, it could be any other religion. I mean, you know, that is obviously a religion. Yeah. I'm talking about outside um, of Christianity because it's... I don't know. I mean, I, I, there's... People are doing everything all the time, and there there will be, um, you know, some irate people on Twitter who will, you know, protest. But I think we, more or less, are living in a fairly laissez-faire society. And when it comes to sexuality, or when it comes to protest, um, now, if we do know that comedians in the United States, for example, uh, and in France, you can make fun of. Christianity all you want, but you know there was the the bombing in Paris of the comedic magazine, the Charlie Hebdo, because they made fun of the, of the Prophet Muhammad. So there, there's a d different standard there. Uh, Roxanne, would you like to add to that? You know, I think again you have to be a little more nuanced than that. Charlie Hebdo was bombed for a lot of reasons, and I don't think it was simply because they chose Islam as their target. The thing is that Christianity in general has been the oppressor, not the oppressed. And so it's punching up when you make fun of Christianity because it is so dominant throughout the world. When you are making fun of Islam and looking at a lot of the rhetoric where people equate a few extremists with billions of people in the world who are faithful and peaceful practicing Muslims, then you have a very different story and that's more punching down. And the kinds of extremists that carried out the terrorist attack against Charlie Hebdo, they would have picked any reason for doing so because they were extremists. And it wasn't necessarily about Islam as much as it was about a violent ideology. Well, wh wh where are the fatwas, you know, coming from Christians? I mean, this was there was a fatwa on Salman Rushdie that came from the from Iran. That was, I mean, they were it came from the leader. So I don't think that's incidental. I think that there is uh, more in, intolerance coming from the, the from Islam threatening comedians, threatening artists. It's different. Before we go to the next question, I want to show a video. Uh, this is from Iran. And when it comes to compulsory hijab in Iran, in Saudi Arabia, the whole world keeps silent. And it, Iranian women, in their fight against compulsory hijab, they are alone. They are on their own. And when you say it's not true, I'm going to give you an example. There were Three female politicians from Netherlands, they went to Iran the same day when one of the Women of White Wednesday's movement put the headscarf on a stick and waved it in public, Shafarak Shajarizadeh, when she got arrested, the same day there were three female politicians from Netherlands in Iran obeying compulsory hijab law without challenging it. And the female politician from Sweden, they were very you know, well-known when they started to publish their picture to mock President Trump's cabinet. 
It was full, you know, the female picture and marking the picture of uh, President Trump's cabinet, which were all male dominated. I was like, I love this picture. It's a good way to criticize a male dominated cabinet. But what happened? The same feminists went to Iran, the same uh, ministers. In Iran, they obeyed compulsory hijab laws in front of the president. I said to myself, well, when it comes to America, they were trying to say women and men are equal. But when it comes to Islamic Republic, they were trying to send another message. Well, men are more equal than women. So the female politician who go and visit to Iran, the tourists, the athletes, actress, all of them, when they go to my beautiful country, they say that this is a cultural issue. We wear it out of respect to the culture of Iran. Let me be clear with you. Calling a discriminatory law as part of our culture, this is an insult to a nation. Do feminists in the West have an obligation to do more to help women in countries that they are oppressed? Say, for example, a country like Saudi, Saudi Arabia. Well, I think so, absolutely. I think that should be one of the, the primary focuses of contemporary feminism. A, a, a few weeks ago, well, it was actually well, more than that, in January, there was a, an extraordinary event. A young Saudi woman uh, had uh, a very brutal father and brother, and they'd beaten her up. She wanted to have short hair. She wanted to be young and modern. You know, she's educated, and she couldn't stand the constraints and fearful of her family. And so she managed to escape. And she was at the, the Bangkok airport on her way to Australia when the, um, she was, it was discovered her, the Saudi government told the Thai officials to hold her there. And her father and brother were on the way to pick her up. And she was in a hotel room thinking of committing suicide. But instead, she took out her iPhone, she went on Twitter, and she told the world about her, her situation. And the world listened, and suddenly women's rights groups, uh, it, well, it went viral on Twitter, and suddenly human rights activists, women's rights activists in Thailand found out about it, and they helped her, and she's now a free woman in Canada. <laughs> it, it, they were able to make that happen quickly. And it seems to me that, we, you know, just last week, we found out that this wonderful human rights lawyer in Iran, she has been, uh, she defends women who are forced to veil. They have forced veiling. I mean, veiling is fine if you choose to do so. I have Orthodox Jewish relatives who cover their, their when you get married, you cover your head, and they, my relatives choose to do it. I, I wouldn't do it, but, but if I were forced to do that, there are women that protest all the time in Iran. And this lawyer, Nassim Saduke, defends them. She was just sentenced to 37 years in prison and uh, 140 lashes. Lashes. I mean, and, I mean, she has children. She's just a wonderful, brilliant scholar. And they're, so do I think we should do be, be uh, you know, forming common cause. I go to international human rights conferences and I meet these women. They're asking where, you know, where is the help? Where they're, they're asking the world for help. We should be there for them. Roxanne, what do you... <laughs> all, I have, all I have to do is just mention Roxanne's name and we'll be good. <laughs> uh, Roxanne, what do you think of... Uh, uh, do, do you think feminists in the West have an obligation to do more to help uh, Yes, I think that we have an obligation to address oppression wherever it lives, whether it's in the United States or Australia or Saudi Arabia or Iran. And the reality is that it does exist in all of these places to different degrees. But I also think that it would be really presumptuous of me as a feminist to think that I would know best what's best for Saudi Arabian women. Um, who have been very effective at organizing. We saw this, especially in recent years, as they fought for the right to drive. 
And, you know, from a Western perspective, you think, my goodness, you're still fighting for the right to do this very basic thing and to have this very basic amount of independence. But I don't know that they need exter external intervention. What they need is our support materially, probably financially, and certainly in terms of highlighting voices in those communities who are leading these movements to create change. So I think that support can come in a lot of different ways, but I don't think it needs to come in an interventionist way, because I don't think that we know better than what those communities need for themselves. Um, I want to show you a video um, that I've uh, found. This is a recent video. This is from um, Indonesia. Today, we're at one of their routine street raids. A checkpoint is set up, and within minutes, dozens of women are being pulled over. The female Sharia officers interrogate the women about their clothing. These girls were on their way to school. Their bodies are covered head to toe. But their pants are too tight and their hijabs too revealing. Captain Latif, those girls told me they're just 15. Are they not too young to be punished? Ah, bisa 15 tahun, bisa 9 tahun. Jadi kalau dia sudah datang hit, sudah wajib hukum syara kepadanya. Yang laki-laki, apabila dia telah mengalami mimpi-mimpi basah. Roxanne, from picking up from where you, where you left off, by any standard, doesn't that seem like oppression? Yeah. <laughs> it does seem like oppression, but I think it's really manipulative to show a video like that to sort of say, look at this culture in their backwards ways. <laughs> when we are dealing with the very same issues in the Western world, only it's not encoded by Sharia law. Um, is that oppressive? Of course it's oppressive. I mean, that's like asking if the sun shines. Yeah, like, yeah, it shines. It, it's, I think, that's not a super productive question. Um, Can I? Sure. I go to international women's conferences at, in New York City where they, particularly one, the women of the world, they bring the leaders from the women's groups, the feminists in Indonesia and in Egypt, from Ghana, Nigeria, Cambodia, and it's exciting because you're sort of meeting the, the, like the feminist foremothers that you know, we would see, the Sojourner Truth of that society, or the Elizabeth Cady Stanton. You meet them, and they are the bravest women in the world, the, the, the feminist foremothers in this country. <laughs> never faced anything, anything like, they, they face uh, imprisonment and lashing and so forth we talked about, and they ask for our help. And here's a way we could help. For example, Saudi men now have the ability, thanks to Apple and uh, Google, I guess, they can download an app and track where their wives and daughters are, and they get an alert if she tries to cross the border. Now, uh, some senators and congressmen in the United States found out about this and have asked Apple to take away this capacity, and so far they haven't. This is. This is the sort of thing that the uh, Saudi, I know the Saudi women are asking us to do something about. So I agree with you that we're not going to be lady bountiful and go, oh, well, you know, we'll liberate you. No, no, let's just listen to the feminist leaders, women in those countries, and help them in the ways they're asking. We're talking about minorities here. So I want to understand the terminology that I personally 
don't really understand. So, Roxanne, um, help me understand intersectionality better. What exactly is intersectionality? Well, intersectionality is a way of thinking about feminism in that we're not just women, we contain other identities. And we have to consider the whole of a person's identity when we're thinking about how we help them achieve equality and equity. And so it's not just gender, it's sexuality, class, ability, race, ethnicity, uh, religion, um, any number of factors. And the reality is that not all women are treated equal. And intersectionality helps us to address those inequalities within our gender. Christina, taking on from there, do you think if we do not acknowledge intersectionality, we will miss or we might miss the minorities and uh, their needs we, uh, in, in the West? Yes, well, intersectionality at the heart of that theory is an, a very you know, a fundamental insight, which was, it, the theory has been around for a long time, but it was given the name by Kimberly Crenshaw a, at the time, a young law professor at UCLA, and she was looking at how uh, black women could get sort of lost at the intersection of race and, and gender. And there were civil rights laws that applied to, uh, based, to you based on your race. There were gender laws that are on your sex, but what happens to African-American women? And she found that that complicated identity rendered them vulnerable to mistreatment and humiliations and that were unique to their situation. Now, over the years, this has become um, a very just uh, active area of scholarship. And there was a conference a few years ago, and they tried to get together and decide what it means, and is it a theory, is it a prism, and there are a lot of arguments. So we have yet to see exactly what will survive the, you know, the criticism and what this theory will become, and that's, that just happens to a lot of things in the academy. That's nothing new. What is new is that a very radical, kind of hardline version of this theory was fast-tracked into the culture. And suddenly you have you know, young people thinking that we have to divide everyone and look at everyone in terms of their, where they are on what, I saw one textbook on intersectionality referred to the United States as a matrix of oppression. And everyone, there was a sort of wheel, an axis, and you could see you know, where you stood. And it was an elaborate, almost a conspiracy theory about the world where there were people on top and there were people on the bottom and you had special privileges based on your location, except that could be true except that the, the categories were so broad. So it was like white males um, were on the campus, you know, sort of thought to be uh, the most culpable and carrying unearned privilege. Well, that covers a lot of people. In fact, you know, and some of them have privilege, some might not. You have to look at the details, and somehow the intersectionality never applied to them. Meantime, they kind of attach it to a, a, a sort of Marxist analysis of society. So it's suddenly, to be intersectional in this radical theory, you have to want to overthrow uh, capitalism and the free market, you know? And they, they're very vague about what they're going to replace it with. <laughs> capitalism is just another word for economic freedom. If you have economic freedom... <laughs> Okay, all right. We'll, oh my God. We'll, 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 we'll come to capitalism in a bit. I think uh, there's a few people, uh, obviously, that have another opinion. Um, Christina, you've mentioned that the gender pay gap is a myth. Uh, what do you mean by that? <laughs> well, what I mean is that the idea that on average, you know, um, a man is paid, you know, 25 cents more, 23 cents more uh, for the same work as a woman. Um, there's just no evidence of that. In, in, in the, you know. Okay. Uh, okay. No, can I explain why? Can I explain? 
And, sure. and you know, jeering at an idea or clapping at an idea doesn't make it true or false. What matters is the evidence. So let's look at the evidence. If, and, and even feminist economists agree with this, if you look at the gap in, in the uh, workplace, what you find is you have to account for relevant differences and, and, and take into account variables. For example, the wage gap in the United States is, it varies, but people usually say, you know, women earn 76 cents for every dollar. White and, women. Yeah. White women earn 76 cents on the dollar. Yes, and, and uh, the highest earners in the, are Asian men and the gap between Asian men and, and, uh, men and, and Asian men and white men is bigger than the gap between men and women. So why, why would that be? Is it, is it because there's a, the system is rigged in favor of Asian men? Well, actually, what, what you do are the proper controls. Like, what, did, what, how many years of education did they have? What did they study in college? You do that with men and women, and the, the, the gap begins to narrow. And is it because employers are cheating them out of their salary? That we don't find evidence for. What we find evidence is that men and women, on average, make different decisions. For example, college majors, the highest paying college majors, like electrical engineering, or petroleum engineering, you find far more men in that major. It, the, for women, you find a lot going in, women going into psychology, uh, is, is sociology, early childhood education. Those jobs may be very fulfilling, but they don't pay as much. And they're just, you know, as I said, more women. But you're ignoring... Uh, okay. I, I would like to bring, because you, you yeah. mentioned uh, data and stats, so let me show you something. This is from the World Economic Forum. This is an extensive study, and this is a 10-year study, and there is definitely... Uh, you know, this is obviously the summary, but I've read the whole study. It seemed to really suggest, and World Economic Forum is an apolitical organization, it's, it's clear that there is some sort of a gap, and it is that 20 cents mark globally. So... Now you're going global or the United States? Global. Global. Absolutely. All right, because there's a different story. In different countries, it's sure. different. And, but if we can understand the United States, we can understand other places. There are... I didn't... I don't... I didn't deny there are places that okay. have systemic bias. There are countries that are absolutely patriarchal. The United States, the United, the United States is Come on, let's. is a, a society where women and men have achieved equality before the law. And if you, if your employer, it be, I mean, there's all kinds of data out there, but. The pay gap is not d under dispute, and there are all kinds of reasons why women don't necessarily go into petroleum engineering, and those reasons have everything to do with misogyny and the fact that women are not allowed to succeed in these fields. It's incredibly difficult to go into engineering. It and is difficult. I have some expertise in this. My dad's an engineer, and I went to an engineering university to get my PhD, where it was 77% male. And so we have all of these systemic biases that push women into certain fields and that make other fields incredibly inhospitable. Like, I teach at a state university, so everyone's salaries are easy to find. And so even when you control for education, and um, pretty much everyone has a PhD, uh, within fields, men make more. And so the pay gap is not this imagined thing. The pay gap is very real here in Australia. It's real in the United States. It's real in Japan. And we have to start demanding that this be a thing of the past and suggesting that, oh, men are from Mars and women are from Venus, and that's why women make less, is just so insulting. But and it doesn't take into account other things like race and ethnicity. So while 77 cents to the dollar is the statistic in the United States for white women, 54 cents is what Latina women make on the dollar. And so we have to also look at how women from non-white races and ethnicities are dealing with an even greater pay gap. And it, it just cannot being wished away with this idea that the gap is imaginary. It isn't. So how would you answer, say, for example, the, I want to get, an, I want to pick an American example. Um, the American women's soccer team 
is rated number one in the world. And the American men's team is rated 25 in the world. But the American men's team gets a substantial amount of money. And you can't, cannot attribute that to the number of people that watch it because the women's final was watched by 26.7 million and the men's final was watched by 26.5. So how would you... There's still somehow women are getting paid less for doing the same thing as soccer. Yeah, I, as I said, there, there could be that they're just being mistreated. However, if you, uh, if you look at sports in general, like people, if you look at the, you know, uh, the NBA or the WNBA, big gap in what the male players and the female players are paid, but that just has everything to do with just how much money the men's teams bring in, and there's just a big difference in men's basketball and women's basketball, even though they're doing the same thing in, in, in the sense of playing the game. But the market, it, it, it's, it's not comparable. Now, I think with soccer, the men are in the men's league, so they probably are benefiting from all of the money that comes from men's soccer in, throughout the world. So they're in that league. They, they're just beneficiaries. And the women are probably in a women's league, and they get paid less Roxanne, because throughout the world. Would, would, Roxanne, do you want to respond to that one? I mean, it's literally a pay gap. I, so... <laughs> There's, that's the pay gap. Like, who cares what the reasons are? The pay gap is literally there. And actually, professional sports is a really good example of the pay gap because women in the WNBA generally during the offseason come over to Europe, Australia, uh, China to play ball because they have to supplement their incomes versus men who are making these $140 million four-year contracts. Um, and the soccer team example is actually really one of the most stark examples of the pay gap, and it's one of the most egregious because the women's team is so successful and so popular, and the men's team, the U.S. football team, just they can't play at all. <laughs> they're not good. And yet, because they're men, they get pay. And in fact, the women's team has tried various forms of striking, especially in the past year, to little avail. And it just shows how rigid, as someone in the audience pointed out, the patriarchy is. And that even when women are at the top of their game, quite literally, it's still not enough for them to be paid an equitable wage. So I want to stay... Uh, I, I, just, uh, I just will say one thing. But with, it, it, with soccer, it's possibly... There, we'd have to look into it, and there may be an explanation. <laughs> but, but I'll tell you, men's basketball and women's basketball... They're not, it, there's, it's leagues apart. I mean, the, the, the idea that... It's leagues apart because the NBA has been around for much longer and has gotten so much more material support than the WNBA. The no, WNBA continues no. to struggle for funding mm. because people don't think when people are interested in women's basketball. It's misogyny at play. It's not that no. it's a different game. It's, it's that people don't care. It's a different game. The, it, the male basketball players, they play at a, it's a Promethean you know, <laughs> kind of competition. I mean, look, you may like it uh, uh, to watch women's basketball. Most people don't. They can hardly get an audience in the United States. And they say, oh, it's not enough advertising. I'm sorry, but lesbians love the shit out of women's <laughs> basketball. Uh, the Los Angeles Sparks generally sell out their games. All of this, like, there is not a, a more, there is not a more devoted fan base. There is plenty of audience for women's basketball teams. Okay. On religion, I want to talk about the Me Too movement. Um, Christina, do you think the Me Too movement has gone too far? Because you've alluded to that in few interviews. And, uh, or has the movement been a turning point for feminism globally? Well, I'm, I still have hopes for this movement because I think that um, we have reached a, a state where there was clearly a need to bring the standards of, you know, of the workplace and life in general. Just We needed to uh, have a kind of uh, renegotiate the contract between men and women and bring it up to 21st century standards of equality and mutuality and respect. However, there's 
our from the beginning there was a mix of you know just common sense and bringing people together as opposed to those who wanted to use it sort of to to as a gender war and sort of women telling men just you know how toxic they are most men are toxic some are but many many men support the me too movement and i think that it's something that men and women have to do together it's not you know a zero sum game like we put them down and we go up no we go men and women we you know our fates are connected and we are you know that's just how it is so it, you, can't, you can't have this as if we're two rival teams and now it's men's turn to shut up like Matt Damon was defending the me too movement he was he went you know couldn't have been more supportive but he he did say he thought there should be uh some fairness in how much men are punished and he thought you know some proportion that, that the punishment should be proportional to the crime and so he said you know what Al Franken isn't equal to uh, Harvey Weinstein Weinstein and then the next you know which was completely reasonable <laughs> to me and to most people but the next day there were like 20,000 me tooers you know radicals who'd signed a petition demanding he be erased from his next film and many drivers said it's just time for you to be quiet you know and listen and then he 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 apologized you know and i mean Matt Damon can take care of himself but think of the most men would have felt like they were just being told to shut up to tell men that's not feminism that's bullying feminism should be about men and women speaking to each other as equals you don't replace male chauvinism with female chauvinism Roxanne <laughs> do you like do you like to comment on that I don't think telling men to stop talking and listen to women is chauvinism. Uh, I think that you know I, I think that we're in the very beginning of me too even though we're now about a year and a half in and this initial thrust has been about women bringing voice to the very real issues they've faced in the workplace and their personal lives and you know we men have plenty of platforms like this idea that we need to cry for men or worry that they're being silenced somehow simply because women are speaking is not true they're going to be okay and it's really interesting that when women achieve equality men perceive it as oppression and people say oh you know we're taking something away from them but that's never what feminism has been about it's not about taking anything away from men it's about giving women the same privileges that men have and one of those privileges is bodily autonomy and being able to go to work without being sexually harassed and being able to walk down the street without being catcalled and so when someone like Matt Damon a multimillionaire who is very famous <laughs> says you know oh um there should be some fairness of course there should be some fairness but the backlash was because people are so tired of bending over backwards to accommodate the male ego and there's something to be said for men just taking a step back for a few years and just being a little quiet it's okay <laughs> will still make progress they will not be left behind in some material form or fashion they'll just listen and learn the same way that we're supposed to listen to women leaders in other countries think about feminism i think men would do really well to listen to what women have to say about what we see as equity in the workplace and what we see as what should happen next in terms of me too Roxanne, on that same point, what do you think the movement can do to continue to be effective and what dangers are ahead for the movement? Well, you know, the the biggest danger facing me too is exhaustion and people just saying, "Oh, I can't believe we're still talking about this." Uh, you know, like it's been a whole year and a half. Uh, come on, ladies. You've only been dealing with our bullshit for hundreds of years. Um you know i think what we need to do now is move beyond testimony which is not to say that people should stop sharing their stories of things that they've experienced but what do we do with this information and how do we prevent it from happening again how do we create a better world which is a huge question 
Um, how do we encourage or demand that the justice system respond adequately to these kinds of things? How do we create systems where women can come forward in their workplace without repercussion and without fear of retaliation or of losing their jobs? Because as many people as have come forward, there are a great many people who are silenced. And one of the key things that we've seen in the Me Too movement is that it's the most privileged among us who have come forward because we can afford to do so. And there are plenty of women who can't afford to do so. There's a really great book called All in a Day's Work. And it talks about working class women who are dealing with sexual harassment and have very little recourse. And so these are the kinds of things that we have to think about. How do we support the most vulnerable among us? And how do we create a system of justice that actually can adequately respond to people who come forward. If we don't start coming up with solutions, we're just gonna keep talking and talking and talking, and we have to do something more productive than that, even though I do think that there was a need for what has taken place over the past year and a half. Um, I wanna bring up a tweet you put out. Um, this is about Aziz Ansari, and this, this goes to your point. Um, this says, um, why is Aziz Ansari being lumped in with Louis C.K. and Matt Lauer? God, I wish more people did journalism and writing on hashtag Me Too with Care, which leads to the point that uh, you, know, you agree that um, not what all... Was Matt Damon's point. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but so and I agree there with are you. Same degree, uh, there are some degrees of, of, of crime. So, I think journalists have a quite an important role to play. I think that's one of the points you, you make here. Well, definitely. The media is lazy, and oftentimes they find a few talking points, oftentimes that are inaccurate, and they regurgitate them for years on end, and they flatten issues. And so what Aziz Ansari did versus what Louis C.K. did, versus Matt Lauer, Harvey Weinstein, and so on. These are things that exist along a spectrum. And right now, the media continues to talk about these things as if they're all at the same point on the spectrum, and such is not the case. And I think that we need to have enough of a sense of ethics to differentiate and to say, yeah, it's all bad. It is all bad. but. What Aziz Ansari did is not a crime versus what Harvey Weinstein did, which was absolutely a crime. And how do we create space to acknowledge that they're both bad while also acknowledging the differences? And the press is just so eager to be first and to be the most condemning that they don't take a step back and consider any of these stories with nuance. And then there are people who are just like, oh, see, look at these feminists, they're so angry. All that guy did was have a bad date. And it's a little more complicated than that. It really is, because in the Aziz Ansari story, which was poorly sourced, poorly written, and deeply problematic, you could still see strains of a lack of awareness about enthusiastic consent, for example. And we can talk about that. Um, Aziz Ansari, as a successful comedian, he will be fine at, at the end of this. Um, but somebody who's not at the same social uh, level, how would, excluding people like you know your Bill Cosby's and Harvey Weinstein's, how would a man who's been accused of something like this um, redeem themselves? Is 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 that? Should that be part of the conversation as well? <laughs> uh, yes, redemption should be part of the conversation, but I don't know that we should be... Like, we, we always rush to redemption before there's any reconciliation. Everyone's like, oh, shouldn't they come back? Like Louis C.K., when he started doing comedy again, people were like, oh, it's been a long year. And I'm like, really? <laughs> He's a millionaire. He was fine. I fucking assure you, he was fine. Um, but I think that in terms of redemption, it's not necessarily up to us as members of the public to determine what that should be. I think it's up to the people who have been harmed by those people's actions that should determine what his, the, that path to redemption should look like. Uh, and I just think it's a question of timing. I, oftentimes it's just way too soon, but who knows? Clearly these days everything is just um, terrible. Roxanne, um, uh, 
I'm going to ask you one more question, and I'll come to you, Christina. Um, you've written a lot about trauma. I think one of the reasons that people uh, really relate to you is it's deeply personal. Um, and a secondary hashtag that came out of the Me Too movement is Believe All Women. And there's been some criticism about that, uh, that, uh, that it leads to false accusation breed chaos and mob justice, claims innocent victims undermine social trust and teaches us to doubt the evidence of our own experience. How would you respond to a claim like that? <laughs> um, you know, in general, I do believe that we should, as a baseline, believe all women. This doesn't mean that we don't vet stories and that we don't seek more, but I think we have to trust that women in general, and men, because men also suffer from sexual assault, there's no reason to lie about this. It's like the worst possible thing. It's a really shitty experience. And so I just don't think we need to have this degree of panic about, oh my God, but what about the one innocent man? <laughs> When, again, we're prioritizing these like needs of men. Nobody should be falsely accused of sexual assault. And anyone who does that, I, I just think, what is your problem? Clearly, they have something seriously wrong going on, and we should condemn it roundly. But I, I think that we oftentimes disbelieve women as a default. So she's lying until we can prove that she's telling the truth. And that's dangerous. Um, and I think, why don't we worry about the women who are not believed as much as we worry about the men who might be falsely accused? Like, I think we have to... Um, Christina, um, you'd be very familiar with that claim because I picked that claim from your 2014 Times article uh, titled, Rape Culture is a, is a Panic Where Paranoia, Censorship, and False Accusations Flourish, um, which seem to go against what Roxanne's saying. Um, but may I make a philosophical argument that believe all women is merely a desperate cry to give a voice to women uh, uh, who have not had a voice for centuries rather than literally believing all women? Yes, and I certainly think that any person who comes and, and uh, who's with the claims of violation should be treated with respect and care but nobody has a right to be believed in without, you know, this is your own friend or something, but someone who wants you to punish someone, wants the state to take action. You have to have due process. You have to go through a process. It's not perfect, but it's the best we have. And it's, it's been in our system. It's been a principle of, of, just sort of civilization going back to the Magna Carta, that you have some protection of, of being able to give your side of the story when you're accused. And it's, it's a horrible thing to be harassed and, and, and violated, of course, but it's also a horrible thing to be falsely accused. It is, I have heard so many stories now because I write about this and and it's sort of it's psychologically annihilating for these people. Uh, they lose everything. That you get accused, and you can't. And, and I just last week was speaking to a young man who's a journalist who became a non-person because of someone wrote a story. He says it's not true, and it's nothing that could ever go to a court of law. But it made him seem like he could be. You know, that he lost his job. He lost friends. He he. he you're just, um, it's devastating. And we have, to, we have to be careful. We have to be, we have to be protective of everyone and have a system that, that, that I mean, it could, there are ways to improve it. But up till now, what's happening is people are so desperate to protect the women, mostly women, is that they are making secret lists and you get anonymous informants, you know, circulating lists. And there have been innocent people on those lists who find it impossible to defend themselves. And, you know, we have a bad history with blacklists. 
going back in the, in the United States to McCarthyism, calling someone a communist. Call, you have to have evidence. You can't have an anonymous informants that can have the power to take someone down. It's, um, so, um, we, <laughs> we, um, so, in the same, same article you talk about rap hysteria and you equate what's happening now to the child abduction hysteria in the 80s. Um, child which, daycare centers. Right. Um, but um, is that a fair comparison? I think that on uh, college campuses, we now have almost, it, it's, it's um, a contagion of um, hysteria and where, it, it, and these are places, you know, Swarthmore College or Wesleyan, you know, the most, the places where young women are probably the most empowered, the most privileged, and the safest of any women on earth. Yet these young women, they're getting this idea that the young men at Swarthmore at Wesleyan, you know, are predators and they, and they uh, have this very simple sort of view of the world about this, that they live and inhabit this culture where they feel as oppressed. I mean, they identify with the handmaid's tale and they think they're living in the equivalent of a handmaid's tale. To me, it is madness and it's a kind of... Um, a, a moral panic. I think we are in the middle of a moral panic around around sexuality, and it's it does it doesn't. The thing about it is, it doesn't solve problems. There is a real problem of sexual harassment and sexual assault on campus. It, it is a problem. It's not an epidemic. It's not threatening. You know, the, it, it it it's it needs attention. But what they've done is turned it into an all this all encompassing threat. Um. And, and they're not, they're not attending to the problem. I, I want to go to Roxanne, but you, you mentioned something, it's not an epidemic. So I've heard uh, a fair few interviews, you, you talk about uh, the, the data set of one in four, one in five women being sexually assaulted or raped is, is, a, is not true. And you refer to a data set where it shows it's one in 52, which is relevant to the American university sector. So I looked up, there's roughly about 21 million students in American universities. If you were to go by the one in 52 number, that's over 400,000 serious sexual assaults and rapes. That sounds like an epidemic. Um, the, you have to look, they've done a study of, the uh, Bureau of Justice Statistics looked at um, American universities and pulled out the data and it was, they asked very good questions, they had, uh, a huge sample of people. They were personal interviews. It was, it was, they set the gold standard for research. And they found that, yes, I said it's a serious problem, but they, they were looking at 18 to 24 year olds, uh, males and females on campus, and they found that about, it's, it, uh, it's less than 1%, but in a population of you know, I don't know, at that age group, there's uh, six million young women that age. So it's a lot, it's a big number. So there's no question that every school, and that includes rape and sexual assault, and you know, it, it, they cover if someone grabs you or gropes you, or the, it covers the gamut. So of course we need reasonable policies and we need to be attending. But what this one in four would mean that would mean, if, and that's all the students here, one in four, one in five, that would mean that the college campus is more dangerous than the war-torn Congo. It would mean that the, these campuses are facing an epidemic of predation that's like a Bosnian rape camp or something. I mean, that's... I think, uh, I think we should bring in Roxanne at this point. <laughs> Roxanne, you have a loss. <laughs> you are thinking right now. I think that it's... It's so terrible to compare that statistic to the Congo or a Bosnian war camp because that's not what anyone's saying. If one in four, one, one in, in four? One in four women have been sexually assaulted and that is a container that includes rape and other forms of harassment and assault. So 
that is fairly accurate. It's not rape itself, which is probably closer to the one in 52. It's a range of experiences that fall under this umbrella. And I think it's important to listen to that statistic because women are feeling unsafe because they are unsafe. It's not a moral panic. We're not having a moral panic in any way. I was at Swarthmore four weeks ago, and the women there were fine. They were walking around being young students. Uh, I teach on a college campus, and this doesn't come up in the way that the media exploits it. But on every single campus that I go to, including the one where I teach, people are deeply concerned about the prevalence of sexual assault, and even more importantly, the reluctance of administrations to actually deal with the problem. Oftentimes, we're seeing institutions that let these rapists stay in school. So we have young women who are going to classes with their rapists. Uh, we see that they discourage students from contacting local police because they want their campus police who are beholden to the institution more than to the greater good adjudicating these issues. And so there are some really big problems that are happening on college campuses. And rather than to dismiss it as moral panic or to suggest that women are pretending or imagining this as if it's some sort of terrible movie, I think we should really listen to what's happening on college campuses and take it more seriously because there's a difference. And I don't think that there's a single girl or young woman on a college campus who would say that she believes she's living in The Handmaid's Tale. But I do think that there are a lot of women who are thinking we're about 10 years away. <laughs> and... Can I just say one thing? Okay, one thing. quickly, because we're running quickly. out of time. I didn't realize. Um, and what I, I, worries me the most is that, um, to the extent that we have a, a serious problem, which no one here is denying, there's actually a, a good study, it was in the New England Journal of Medicine, about how you could cut the numbers and how you could get it down of this untoward behavior and too much, you know. Uh, uh, and what they found was that uh, girls are most vulnerable freshman year, and it, is, it has to do with sort of uh, binge drinking and drunken parties and fraternities and all the things you could, all the things. So they found, they found they could cut the numbers substantially, and this was peer-reviewed, careful research, and the young women would take a course and they would learn uh, about... Now, exactly. Um, Everyone... Every... Okay. Okay, let's, let's be civil here. Showing somebody how not to be a victim is not victimizing them. Um, that's... Um, Christina, doesn't that put the onus on uh, the, I mean, surely we could have a class that shows young men how not to victimize. <laughs> uh, you know what? You know what? Um, a young man, a young man, you have to... <laughs> okay. I, I think, just, I think <laughs> there's a better solution. Constantly, what we do when we talk about rape prevention is tell young women what not to do, where not to walk, how to walk down the street, carry mace, carry your keys in your hands like a claw, don't go out at night, don't drink too much, don't leave your drink unattended while you go to the bathroom. Like, really, all of these problems could be solved by men learning to not rape. <laughs> all of these problems could be solved. If we, there, it, it, there are predators out there, it's a small percentage, but there are one, one percent of the population is, so, is psychopathic, three or four percent sociopathic. There are dangerous predators, and you must protect yourself. Teaching someone, telling a, a, someone to look both ways before they cross the street, you don't say, oh, don't tell them that. Tell drivers not to hit, hit them. No, you, you, you do both, you do both. But right now, I think I have to say the reaction of this audience. I've told you there is a way that you, there, you could help bring the numbers down because a lot of it is young people in college, binge drinking, and they learn, they learn, they learn cues about if someone is, uh, just things that apparently they haven't learned. This helps them to uh, sort of navigate the world and be aware of the dangers. You ha how can you not teach that 
uh, to a, 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 ch a child uh, uh, is going off to college, a young person going off to college, and yet the reaction was many feminist groups did not want to have this training because they didn't fit the agenda. And so the agenda apparently is not protection. It's, it's forwarding a theory about um, Okay, you know, the I want to move on from this conversation. Roxanne, you voiced your disappointment when one of your favorite publications, New Yorker, decided to invite Steve Bannon. And for anyone who's not sure about Steve Bannon, uh, he was the chairman of Breitbart News and he was instrumental in getting Donald J. Trump elected. Um, when you were promoting this event, a journalist asked you, um, if you were against Steve Bannon, how are you for being at this event with somebody who you categorize as a white supremacist. Do you actually think Christina is a white supremacist? Oh. You meant a white wine supremacist. No. <laughs> you know, Dash, when I agreed to do this event, I did not know who Christina was. And I don't say that in a, in a mean way, it's just the truth. And I, I don't know that she knew who I was, it's okay. Um, and so then the Southern Poverty Law Center emailed me and said, here's who this person is. And I said, oh, oh, What did okay. they tell you? <laughs> um, they talked about a lot of your work um, in terms of male supremacy and some of the other things that you've done over the years. And, you know, the difference between Steve Bannon is that Steve Bannon was in the White House and he was shaping America's political future and he had a direct hand in what was happening today. And so there is a material difference, but you know, I think we all make mistakes in judgment from time to time. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, just so uh, we can move on from that question, Christina. Um, can I have my you, say? Do you, do you consider yourself <laughs> Uh, to be, I mean, you are a registered Democrat from what yes, I've read. Yes. Um, and do you think uh, West uh, America and the West in general have a problem with racism? The West in general? Yes. Yes. Okay, so would, uh, if someone were to accuse you of a white supremacist, how would you respond to that? Well, first of all, I'm also Jewish, and I think white supremacists have a problem with Jews as well as. Uh, uh, other races, so um, I would be, it, it's appalling to me, it, it, that sort of language. I didn't, I didn't think you meant it, I thought the, the, that they, they confused you, I don't know, but. No, uh, I wasn't confused. Um, <laughs> it was more, they, that's not exactly what I said uh, to the journalist, to be fair to myself. Um, it was that someone who's willing to appear on stage with someone like Milo, and to be on radio shows with other white supremacists, like, and then not disavow that, I think that it makes you white supremacist adjacent. And yeah. that's certainly something that concerns me. I, I think that when we legitimize people like Milo, when we give these people airtime, we suggest that their viewpoints are worthy of consideration. And, you know, they're not. I just, they're not. There's, and it's not about conservatism. My brother's a Republican. <laughs> True story. I have no problem with conservatives. But I do have a problem with virulent racists who say really crazy and offensive things and then call it entertainment. But then they have hundreds of thousands of followers who take it very seriously and then become radicalized and do dangerous things in the public space. And so... I think it's something to be concerned about, and it's definitely something that... Well, I'll, I'll just say that I, um, first of all, I do um, thank you for appearing with me because these days um, there's so much polarization, people don't talk to one another. I happen to be a fairly uh, standard, moderate Democrat. Uh, my views are either very liberal on most topics, on feminism, I still, I was a feminist in the, in the, my mother was a feminist, I was a feminist in the 70s, 80s, but I do feel the movement has become extreme, I feel we're becoming polarized, that language, like, like white supremacy, 
it's being inflated to include like, it kind of means like people I don't agree with. And, and then guilt by association and collective guilt. I worry that there's, that, that, you know, there's just too much of this in the public sphere. And it may not be this way in Australia, but in the United States, there's so much division and, and real uh, contempt for people on the other side. And especially, I feel it coming from the left towards moderates. And contempt and almost a sort of dehumanization where people just suddenly see you as evil when you're just human and, you know, and you're willing to learn. But anyway, I am glad that you were willing to have this discussion. So hopefully, to add to the, the positive nature here, I want to end with uh, my last question. Roxanne, what does the future of feminism look like to you? I don't know. That's a really good question. We think about it a lot, but I would hope that the future of feminism is such that we move beyond basic conversations about our women people and move into more complex conversations and actual like solutions. Like how do we once and for all get rid of misogyny? How do we do that? And how do we free women up to truly thrive without having to deal with the ills of misogyny time and again, both in the Western context and beyond? And I would love for us to get there because it just seems like we're having some of the very same conversations now that we had 50 years ago and even 100 years ago. And that doesn't seem terribly productive. Christina, well, uh, uh, <laughs> Christina what are you fighting for as a feminist right now? Well, there, I think what's exciting about the Me Too movement and really just what I see in, in the, among millennials and i-geners or whatever we're calling, younger, younger people, uh, there's a r real possibility for um, just reaching a totally new level of equality and respect between men and women. But I think it's something that um, men and women should do together. And I do uh, I, I worry about sort of a, I sometimes see signs of female chauvinism as a replacement for male chauvinism. And I hated male chauvinism, but I don't like female chauvinism. Or f and there is something called misandry, like there is misogyny. And there's a lot of, even, a lot of misandry out there, just uh, treating men in, in, in thinking of men as just kind of monolith and, and you know, toxic and masculinity as a pathology and just a lack of understanding and compassion. We need, it. we need to see one another as human and as equals, and I think this generation can get us there, but, and it's still early uh, for you know, a new wave of feminism, but that's my hope. It's, a, it's gonna be about men and women coming together. We're not two separate teams competing for different trophy. We're on the same team, and our futures are, the future, they, we build it together as equals. Okay, with that, I'd like to open the questions to the audience. Do you guys have any questions? Um, my name is Ellen. Just to say a big thank you for both of you, like, I guess, helping out tonight. Um, my question, I guess, is more to Roxanne. Um, so I come from a background of doing, like, forensic biology and that kind of thing, and the stuff that we studied at uni was always, like, um, miscarriages of justice, like, looking at the justice system and how it has faulted people, but every single thing that they gave us was a white male, mm -hmm. that we could study was a white male. And if you look at the justice system in America, which is obviously what you were used to, or in Australia, which is what a lot of us are focusing on, is that um, actually we have indigenous deaths in custody, whether yeah. male or female. We have a lot of issues within our judicial system, and you would have the exact same thing there. And my question, I guess, to you is what could us as people um, within this room do to step forward and actually mm -hmm. take a stand and to do something and to help these people who are being uh, prejudiced in the judicial system mm -hmm. and actually help them and to do something and to say that whilst you might be a woman of colour and whilst you might be caught up in this legal system, what can we do mm -hmm. for someone from a forensics background or a legal background? Or yeah. 
any kind of background from every single person that actually sits in this room tonight. Uh -huh. What can we do to take a stand and actually say that there should be equality yes. in enact a reform within our judicial system to help people? Yes, that's a great question. And, you know, it's one for which I don't have an answer because we're all trying to find those answers. But increasingly what I'm finding is that Whenever I think about the problem in its full scope, I just think I'm one person, how can I help? And so I st start to look at what can I do in my little life to address inequality in some form or fashion. And so one of the key things that you can do is point out to your professors, for example, because they love this kind of critique, they don't. <laughs> uh, they really do, but you want to find ways of, after graduation, introducing suggestions for curriculum that include people beyond the traditional canon. The canon exists for a reason. It's not that we should ignore it, but to suggest that white men are the only people who have anything to say on any given subject is to ignore literature, history, music, art, and frankly, everything. And so that's one key way. Another key way is to take stands. A lot of times people say, um, I have a racist uncle, but I love him, so I'm going to go hang out with him. And we have to start making these difficult choices in our personal lives as well. And it's not to say that you have to ostracize your family, but you do have to be willing to have the difficult conversations where you press them and ask them, why do you believe what you believe? Why do you act the way you act? And when you hear injustice happening, when you hear people saying racist or misogynist or homophobic or transphobic things, it's not that you want to be a killjoy all the time, but if we don't start holding ourselves and our friends accountable, how can we expect people to hold our culture accountable? And so it's starting to do that. Thank you so much. And I guess that's the last one. Hi, um, my name's Alicia. Um, this question is for both of you. Um, Christina, you spoke earlier about um, educating women on how to avoid being sexually assaulted. My question is, does that then not put implicit blame on the women who haven't done that training? Absolutely not. Absolutely. Would you... I've been assaulted. I, I would... You know, a, a friend of mine's um, son uh, was, in a, was beaten up in a bar. He was... Uh, I don't know what happened exactly, but... Um, it did turn out that he had drunk a lot and put himself into, you know, and we, we were sort of angry at him and but felt very sorry for him. And you tell, uh, uh, you want to be protective of people and tell them not to get into crazy, you know, make themselves vulnerable. I don't know what parent would send a child off to university and not just give them g good advice on how to remain safe. And that, because you, you cannot, there's no program that we have found to eliminate threat and evil in this world. It exists. We, we, we have brought it in, uh, not under control by any means, but we're relatively safe in you know, our societies, depending on where you go, but at most college campuses, relatively safe. Why not do everything you can to make sure that your daughter, your friend, is making good decisions. And that's, and that's not saying you don't, it, wouldn't, it would be her fault if something happened, but let's just make sure that nothing happens. And there is a study, the New England Journal of Medicine, and several people have urged colleges to do it, but they don't do it. And so, it, you know, I feel that people don't get the protection they, they should, and the wisdom. Teaching someone how not to be a victim is, it's not, Victor, it's not blaming them, it's, it's common sense. It's protecting them. Okay, we... Uh... Sorry, that question was directed to Rector Desmond. Sure. Uh, you know, I, I, the, this idea that we can teach people how to not be victims is... It's just... I, I believe in common sense. I believe that we have to be realistic about the world that we live in and that we have to... You know, we could, we could have some sort of universal curriculum where we teach men not to rape, and men will still commit, some men will still commit acts of rape or sexual assault. But when we put the onus on curriculum, what do we do about women who don't go to college? What do we do about children who are sexually assaulted? What do we do about men who are sexually assaulted? It's like trying to catch water with a net. 
there's no way to catch everyone. And so that's why we need a comprehensive way of looking at this from the perpetrator's point of view, because it's easier to reach perpetrators who are smaller in number than it is to reach potential victims, which is almost everyone. Next I'll question. That <laughs> yes, go ahead. Hello. Um, I think this question goes on from what we've just been talking about. Um, I'd just like to know, this question is directed at you, Summers, mainly. Um, how do you think it actually would go down if instead of teaching women how not to get raped, we were to teach men, or specifically young men, how to control their sexual urges um, and look at women as human beings and not objects? Like, how do you think they would actually hold themselves accountable for that, not only on uni campuses, but just you know, if GPs or something started actually telling young men, this is how you respect a woman, <laughs> and parents followed after that. How do well, you think that would be I, integrated? Um, I hope that most parents, you don't even, you raise a, a humane child, and they, they do not go out, they don't become rapists, but what you're suggesting is that you know, there's just some way in which we could suddenly organize society and there would not be these, these predators out there. Well, there is, there are evil people, there are mentally disturbed people, there are sociopathic people. We can't, we've got to be, all of our kids have to be prepared that you face in the world. And what I'm afraid is that, and this is kind of an example, and it's hard, it's hard to explain these things because People have a blind spot, but this is madness that you wouldn't teach young women going off to college about the dangers of and what they should look out for and be careful of because there are uh, predators. You have to prepare them. No, they did not know. They did not know. Okay. That was the thing. And, and here's the thing about this program. The young women that were in the program were very grateful. They had learned things, and the school still had bystander programs. They had, you know, all, they, they, it's not that you just do that. I'm telling you, it's just one part of an approach, and you seem not to like it, even though it can reduce victimization. You don't like it, okay. Okay, okay, we're gonna move on to the next question. Um, um, this is a question for Christina. Um, Christina, you often use the words hysterical and fainting couch feminist to, ref to describe anti-rape activists. Um, considering the extremely emotionally distressing nature of rape and its high PTSD rates, don't you think using pejorative language to describe activists' emotional distress is unnecessarily offensive? Um, even if you have issues with sexual assault statistics, can't you raise those issues without denigrating people for being upset about rape? Oh, well, I, yeah, when I use fainting couch... No, no, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Let me explain myself. I have used the phrase fainting couch feminism to describe not the rape activists. I'm talking about a style of feminism on the American campus that d insists on trigger warnings and, and safe spaces. And we had a debate, for example, among fem uh, two feminists came to, to uh, Brown University to debate, well, they were debating uh, data on sexual uh, assault in the United States, and there was a libertarian woman, and there was a very feminist woman, and they just had the debate. Well, the students, uh, at the, uh, and with the cooperation of the college president, organized a safe space because they didn't want to hear the debate. And okay, they don't have to go, but they also wanted a safe space. And in this safe room at Brown University, these are college students, they had um, Play-Doh and coloring books and videos of puppy dogs and bubbles. And it was, to me, it was, as a feminist, it was just such infantilization in the name of protecting women. And it was, it, that's why I, I call it fainting couch. And, and it seems to me the opposite of what our feminist foremothers stood for. They thought of us as equal to men and strong, and we can handle a debate, and even with you know, statistics we don't agree with. 
And yet there's this infantilization of women on the campus, and that worries me as a feminist. Protecting people with PTSD is not infantilization. I'd like to go to the next question. Uh, trigger warnings, uh, there is just no evidence. In fact, it just, uh, no. if, there's no evidence that these are no. effective. PTSD is a serious disorder, and there are treatments, but trigger warnings are not one of them. Please. My question is for Roxanne. Um, it sort of goes without saying that what you say resonates with a lot of, a lot of people, and you inspire a lot of people. Um, I guess my question is, when you share a stage with someone, when you share a platform with someone, mm -hmm. Does that constitute a de facto endorsement of what they have to say to the extent that you're saying, I'm going to engage with you on a real level? No, it doesn't. <laughs> um, absolutely not. And I said this in Sydney, and it, it's, not, it's not in a disrespectful way. When I agreed to do this, I did not know who she was. And I, and, and I don't know that she knew who I was. That's, it's not a, I'm not being snarky. It's, this is the truth. Um, and then the Southern Poverty Law Center emailed me to say, you should know who you're sharing the stage with. And by that time, I had already agreed and signed the contract, and I didn't want to back out. And so, you know, it's not an endorsement, but I think it's a fair question. Thank you. And I, I think that's just a smear. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. And such a rude thing, but, but this is the world we're in. We're, the world we're in. People are just, that's contempt to talk about someone that way and uh, th that you would just not even want to listen to me or share the stage because I'm such a dangerous person, but you, you didn't no, know about it. No, it's not that you're a dangerous person. It's that we're talking about things like sexual violence, women's safety, women's lives, trauma, and you're very dismissive. I'm not and dismissive. I take it so seriously that I think we need good research. We need sound policies. And there's policies. plenty of good research out there. There are a lot uh, of ideas that you hold. There and is. we can all listen to them. This is a crowd of adults who have all listened all night. We've been respectful and had a good conversation. But to suggest that it's not damaging to have certain ideologies is really problematic. It is damaging. And it's in my opinion, anti-feminist. And if you want to be heard and respected, the converse has to be true as well. Well, that, that could people it, disagree look, with we your have ideas. different. We have different people that groups that we speak for, and you may not like my opinion, but there are many people that agree with me, and who are not fanatics and not white supremacists or male supremacists or whatever the. Southern Poverty Law Center, who's, who's, which is dissolving right now because of accusations of racism and sexism in the organization. But never mind that. I just think that it, 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 it worries me. What I, have see, what I saw in Sydney and what I see here is uh, this sort of uh, contempt and dismiss, dismissive attitude and, and just jeering at a, at a person that's just trying as much as they can to understand the world and to have constructive policies to diminish harm in the world and, a, and to be fair to people, and I try earnestly to do that, and I have many people that appreciate my work for that, and I just think it's dangerous even for feminism to become so much the property of people that just share what I think is a kind of extreme view about society, and to leave the rest of us out. Anybody that's a moderate, anybody that's a libertarian, heaven forbid a conservative, or even uh, pro-life. I know pro-life feminist women, and I would invite them to the table. I don't agree with them, but we could, we could find common cause on certain important issues for women. So I want to have a feminism that's inclusive and, and intellectually and in every other way, and that would be a, you know, the complete intersectional feminism that would have women from across the spectrum. I went to university in America, I'm a dual citizen there, so I'm quite familiar with the situation as it stands in America. And my university, Adelphi University, I will name drop them, had that exact program where they 
before my freshman year of college, we went through a program to teach women basically how to not be victims and about the dangers of alcohol and drinking too much and all that. And then when I got to the university, one, now that I've gone through and I've graduated, that didn't help a damn thing. So when I know per personally, everyone on campus went through this program, when I know personally at least a dozen women who were raped and or assaulted by one person, who I also knew personally, and knew hundreds of other women who were, again, assaulted and raped on our campus by people from our campus. We went through that exact program that you're talking about, and it solved nothing. So how would you be able to stand behind a program that fails? Because it's not about the victims knowing that they're victims. We know we're victims. We're taught that from the moment that we're born. Well, you, 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 you're saying... You're saying that it failed, but they've done, they, they, it, according to the New England Journal of Medicine study, they did controlled studies and they found that it had an impact and some schools are using it and we'll see. You could tell that to my friend who was right. But life, it does, it, the thing is life is not a controlled study. I, there are lots of things that work in controlled studies, but when you put them out into the actual world where there is very little control, you're gonna get different results. But when they actually compared the young women that had this, uh, the, that had gone through this training, and they compared them with the group that had not had the training, and they were significantly more protected. It's just one part of a solution. But, okay. okay, we'll go to the next question. Okay, um, I will start saying that um, seeing two people with two different views dialoguing in such a positive uh, way is very inspiring, so thank you. And I want to start with this. Um, then I want to continue with the female infanticide. So we have, um, uh, I think that uh, Ms. Uh, Gay uh, talked about the reproductive rights for women, um, uh, but I think that uh, in many places in the world, like for example, what happened in China, India, South Korea, reproductive rights without empowering on women, they created more problems than solutions. And the same thing is happening also in Africa. Um, where a lot of organizations are supplying um, this kind of um, like uh, ultrasound um, sex determination uh, tools and we risk uh, another um, like uh, holocaust of uh, female fetuses. So I, my question is how can we uh, solve this problem? So how, uh, you know, uh, how can we provide reproductive rights, but without all the implications, and it's for both of, both of you. You know, really you're asking, how can we solve the problem of misogyny? I don't know that these two, and we, you know, it's a huge problem. If we knew, we wouldn't be up here, quite frankly. Um, female infanticide is a real problem in many cultures, and it, it isn't access to reproductive tools that makes female infanticide happen, it's misogyny and people valuing boys over girls. And you know, right now in China in particular, they're recognizing what goes wrong. Now they have a surplus of men and not enough women in the country and they're realizing, oh, we made a mistake. And uh, you know, the best thing that we can do is continue to advocate for why female infanticide is an unacceptable practice. No matter what your culture is, there should be no rule where we're like, oh yeah, go ahead and kill the girls, that's fine. Because it's not okay. And there have to be, hopefully from the UN, real repercussions for countries that do this. Because that's the only way people learn is when there are material consequences for these kinds of decisions. And so I think this is one of those places where UN intervention could come in really handy and with also the World Health, eh, the World Health Organization. Christina, do you want to? No, I think that was fine. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> Hi, I'd just like to start by thanking the other questioners. I think the questions from the audience have been excellent. 
a lot of the questions tonight have seemed quite shallow and almost disrespectful. But I would love to hear from Roxanne and Christina your reflections on Australia in 2019 after your time here. Oh, well, uh, I was um, a little concerned. With, uh, this is my second trip, and I was more uh, worried about the dangerous animals more than the, <laughs> more than the dangerous men or women. Um, and but yet last night, in my, I was eating in my hotel restaurant, and I looked at, uh, I, I couldn't finish my meal, and I asked if I could take it back to my room for a container. And um, he, he looked a little surprised, and then he, the waiter came back, and he had a long form that I had to fill out that I would tr treat, I wouldn't sue them if I got poisoned by the food. And I thought it was going to, like, make me take my blood pressure, you know, and I, it was like, so overwhelmingly um, kind of nanny state, like you, you can't you can't leave this hotel without this this restaurant without signing this form that you know. And then it was a little lecture, a hectoring little lecture on how to take care of the food. So um, I'm just wondering if uh, I had a different image of Australia as a sort of rugged and dangerous place, and then it seems like now it's become like hyper protective, even of my caprese salad. <laughs> so. But that's about all. <laughs> um, this is my third time in Australia, and I've had some very interesting experiences <laughs> with the media here over those five years. Um, this has been definitely the best trip, and uh, <laughs> yeah, it has. Um, and certainly the... Uh, <laughs> the scandal of the day with the One Nation Party and the guns has been wild. Uh, <laughs> you know, when an Australian politician tries to get $20 million from the NRA, which is broke, it's just like, <laughs> man, that's a caper. Uh, but every time I come here, it's really interesting to start to notice the similarities that we have culturally and also the differences. And I, I've definitely continued to notice how segregated Australia is, and certainly Sydney and Melbourne, um, and Adelaide, which are the three cities I've been to. And also, you see that segregation reflected on television. And, you know, we always think that we have so much work to do in the United States, but when it comes to at least representative diversity in media, the United States is light years ahead. And that's the, some, the thing I continue to notice. Um, just women seem to be dealing with a level of misogyny on the morning shows here that would never fly. And I just, it blows my mind every time, both when I'm on stage, like on morning television here, and also when I watch it. And so it's interesting to see Australia evolving, because it certainly has even gotten better in the five years I've been here, but also to see just that there's still some work to do. And we see so little conversation about the indigenous populations. And even tonight, when you look at this audience, um, there are not a lot of people of color in this room. And I think part of that is the price point. And uh, part of it is some of the larger segregation that happens. And also, perhaps, just lack of interest, which I totally understand. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's been an interesting visit as always, and Australia, the people of Australia have always been very kind, and I enjoy coming here. Next question, please. Hi, Roxanne. Hi, Christina. Um, we've talked a lot and tonight about rape culture and sexual violence. We talked a lot about... Um, well, you just mentioned about media in Australia. Um, I'd like to take a step back and maybe ask you, how do we keep having those conversation without almost like exploding the subject? That's a great question. And, you know, part of it is that we have to become the best versions of ourselves to have these difficult conversations with people with whom we disagree, because I think a lot of us, myself included, innately believe that we're right. And, I mean, I am, but... <laughs> uh, 
you know, I do think that we have to be open. But the thing is, you know, we see a lot of both sides isms happening lately where you got to hear both sides, but there are certain issues that there are no two sides to. And for me, those issues include misogyny and racism and other forms of ism. And so I think that we have to start by just saying, you know what, racism is not acceptable. And so there's no both sides to entertain. And so let's think about a better conversation we could have. And so that's another part of it. I just don't think there are two sides to a lot of these issues that people love to pretend there are two sides to. Christina, would you like to? Well, I, I think that it's unfortunate that some of the topics that have come up tonight that people can't just sort of calmly talk to another person, another woman, and say, or, or a man, you should be able to debate these things sanely and reasonably and not get hysterical. And that, that happens in too many conversations now. Even someone, you know, can get... You can be talking to someone now, and I think this is what's driving women, making women reluctant to identify as feminists. They think it means that you have to just be, just, you know, think that there's this misogyny out there and your patriarchy and you're, you know, really pissed off if anybody questions it and you know and they're, well, you know, people are going to keep their distance from you and the movement. And there are just too many problems to solve. If, if, if this were just a game, then okay, everybody can go off and be whatever they want, but there are, the, the work of feminism is not over. Uh, the work of, you know, in, in basically improving our society and, and the issues we've talked before about, about racism and, and uh, poverty and so forth, these are urgent problems that we have to come together in a pluralistic society and what the beauty of pluralism means is that you're not always going to get your way. You're going to have to compromise. And I worry in the United States we're, we're not able to talk to each other. The two parties are now so polarized in the United States that a recent study suggested that people who are Democrats or people who are Republicans would accept their, you know, their child marrying you know, out of any religion or across ethnicities and races except not a member of the other party. Like if you marry, that's, that will not have, my parents were a little like that, but uh, if you uh, marry, so, but we've got a, we're in a democracy, a pluralistic democracy. We have to talk to each other and we can't be so in, outraged and, you know, it's, uh, so I, maybe this will be a beginning that we all found our way here. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Um, I just want to quickly say, about what you said before, Christina. It's true that there's two sides to all this, and I think that to your credit, at least you're here. Mm. Um, but the fact, you know, saying maybe there's two groups of people, some agree with you, some agree with Roxanne, it's obviously, you know, your opinion is the, the less popular in this this scenario. Um, but, you know, where is the other half? The, the people that don't agree with what most people here do and the people that think there's misandry, they're not here wanting to engage in the conversation. You know, they're just the trolls on Facebook, and that's kind of the problem. You know, at least you're an academic, at least you're thinking about this. <laughs> yeah, but, it, but I do speak at a lot of universities with big audiences where there are people that, a lot of people that agree with me and invite me to, their, to campuses, so. Mm, but they're not here. So. Well, they're not here. They are. <laughs> are some not of you many. here? Yeah, they're here. Yeah, not as many. Hi. <laughs> but Maybe my, they're just quieter. Yeah, they're, yeah. Quieter for a reason. Um, my question is, I think... <laughs> what did she say? Quieter, Quieter for a reason. reason. But, but uh, yeah, please, let, let's, uh, yeah. if we could, the question. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you. Um, so going back to the idea that men um, are getting sort of railroaded and they're, they're being, um, you know, treated really badly, unfairly and all of this, um, and using examples like Aziz Ansari um, and the guy about that you said lost his job because he put something on Facebook. I mean, not even knowing that, that story, I don't know who that guy was, but I'm assuming that a lot of people knew who he was. What I see is that these men who um, have their careers destroyed and whatnot are famous men. And I think that the point is that if you have a really huge public profile, you do have more of a responsibility to do the right thing. And that, yes, if you do something really egregious um, and do something that might be a normal Saturday night, 
um, but you're a Zizan Sari, you, you are going to have to answer to that. And isn't that the point? That it's not going to ruin the everyday man's life, but it might destroy a famous man's life, and that's what you're dealing with if you're famous. Well, we're covering a lot of things here. With, with the thing about Aziz Ansari was that it was not clear that he'd done anything that was actionable or he, he, the way, we only had her story of what happened on the date. He might have had another story and he was besmirched and, and shamed and humiliated. And I, I just don't like to see that. I don't think many people do to see that done to another human being unless they're culpable and criminal and guilty and, you know, should be punished. So those cases just, that I just don't think we want to commit some wrongs uh, in, in order to get some glorious right when that right is not going to be there. Because if you choose these men, these ends, and you're going to use intimidation and you're going to use, you know, kangaroo courts or set people up for annihilation in, 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 you know, in journalism without any concern or protection for their well-being, then I think that your movement risks being a force for um, in just injustice. And I don't want a feminism like that that, says, that, that is willing to make those sorts of, uh, it is willing to become what it's supposed to be fighting, oppressive. Uh, Roxanne, I'm more familiar with your work, so I'm going to start by giving a little bit of an opening of your text about feminists. So you open with a discussion on privilege, which I think is really interesting and maybe not touched upon so much in tonight's debate. I think on this stage itself, you have a varying level of privilege. So my question is to you both, and you know, Roxanne, you in particular talk about affirmative action in your book. You say that privilege is something that you struggle with, and that you don't necessarily come to complete understanding of, and I feel I have very much the same, I'm of the same mindset. So. My question is, would the world be a better place if women from privileged backgrounds turned down any benefits arising from affirmative action programs? Um, it depends, because there are all kinds of privilege. Um, I do think that oftentimes it behooves those of us who have a great deal of privilege to share the ladders that we've climbed to achieve what we've achieved, and that means expanding opportunities and sharing our stages and platforms, absolutely. Christina? Yeah, I guess um, I, don't, I do not find the language of privilege that helpful. I think, you know, like in, in a society like ours, you, people are very complicated and someone that can appear to be the most privileged person in the world, you don't know what if they have psychiatric disorders, if they have in the family history, you don't know. People are complicated stories, and I just think we're best if we look at one another as individuals, and especially on the interpersonal level, and then in our universities and uh, where people are competing, I, I can see a case for affirmative action, um, certainly for African Americans, or some have suggested make it not even, because they're now, you know, a lot of privileged African Americans, so maybe that, that's too, too limited. It should be maybe affirmative action based on um, income. So people that have overcome hardship that they, you know, I could, I, I could see something like that. But overall, I think we talk too much about that, and, and the, the worst way to attack uh, race and gender and, you know, various of these um, pathologies is to divide everybody rigidly and constantly be sort of drawing attention and making these divisions so salient about all the time. Um, it seems, it worries me that we're kind of going back to a kind of tribalism and where you judge people by immutable characters, characteristics and not what's in their heart not, you know, uh, in their minds. So I would rather get back to that and away from everyone obsessing about who's more privileged and who isn't. And let's, let's be human. Let's talk to each other. Okay, we have room for two more questions. This will be the last two questions. Please go ahead. Hi. Uh, thanks, guys, for coming out. Um, Did you say guys? Oh, yes. Yeah, sorry about that. That's a microaggression. Uh, 
So, I thought that um, what some people are worried about in these movements uh, within feminism and, and on the left was encapsulated a bit in the talk tonight, just um, within Europe's end saying that Christina Hoff Summers was a white supremacist or associated her with white supremacy just because who she spoke to. Or also you mentioned the SPLC Law Centre, um, but just recently they've been sued by Ajit Nawaz um, because they called him a right you know, anti Islamic extremist. Uh, and he clearly isn't they've been sued and they've got to issue an apology for that. So there's this fear that uh, this kind of Uh, uh, this kind of left wing uh, overreacting is even seeping into uh, previously credible institutes like the Silk City War Centre. So I, I, wonder, I just wonder what you think about that, both of you, and if you think that maybe, you know, we should be more open and talk to each other more. You know, so you use some interesting language like overreaction. But nobody's overreacting. Um, okay. Well, you know, but language matters. So, like, you're saying that, um, you know, that you're worried about overreaction, but language matters. And one of the ways in which language matters is that it's not... Uh, acceptable to just be okay with everything. And when you are willing to associate, and this is generally, not any specific person, when you're willing to associate with people who are white supremacists, you're saying something about yourself. Because that's not a viewpoint that's worthy of respect or of acknowledgement. It truly is not. And This idea that because they're charming or intelligent that they deserve time in, the, in my mind or they deserve time on any given stage or, you know, like they deserve to air their viewpoints. Like they can air their viewpoints, but I certainly don't have to bear witness to it. And I'm certainly allowed to judge it. And I'm certainly allowed to judge people who are more than willing to engage in those conversations because I'm not white. I'm black, and there are very real consequences for me for white supremacy. These are things that affect me materially. They are things that affect my brothers. There are things that would affect my children. And so we can't just sit and play about it. It's not an intellectual exercise, because when I'm driving in my car and a police officer pulls me over, I have to keep my hands on the steering wheel so that he doesn't assume that I'm holding a gun. And this is a very real thing that I live with every single day. When I'm walking into my house late at night and the alarm goes off and the police come and they ask me, who does this house belong to when I own it? A, a nice chat with a white supremacist isn't going to really get me out of that. And so these are not intellectual exercises for marginalized people. It's not something that I sit around worrying about all day, every day, like feeling sorry for myself, but it is something that I am willing to hold hardline judgments on, absolutely. But when you... But, to, but as a, a, a Jewish person, the idea of, of white supremacy is uh, in these, these marches and that we saw is frightening. Mm -hmm. And then suddenly you find public discourse reached a point where they'll, just because you don't agree on certain issues, you have a more moderate position, you're called a white supremacist. The, the uh, Southern Poverty Law Center called uh, uh, Ayan Hirsi Ali, she was thought to be a, a, a called Islamophobic. I mean, she's this uh, heroic uh, S -S Somalian and now American uh, who fights for women's rights across the world. And but she's very critical of a radical Islam. And so they, and now the Southern, Southern Poverty Law Center, they, the, the leaders have been pushed away, have been accused of racism and sexism, and the leadership has just imploded. So that is a problematic organization. And they have been sued. People told me that I should sue. They didn't call me a white supremacist. They said I was an enabler of male supremacy. Um, and they didn't really give any examples of how, but nevertheless, an enabler of male supremacy, male chauvinism. And uh, someone said, oh, you should sue. And I just thought, it, this, this is a once great organization that was fighting you know, dangerous elements on the right. And now, 
I don't know, something happened and uh, they are using their good name to go after people at the center of political debate in the, in the middle and, and, and um, just creating this chaos. So it's a sad thing to see. Can we, there's a few, should we take one or two questions or just the one question? This we can take the three women stand, the, the, the three people stand. All right. And the man. Yes, yeah. and him, yeah. Okay, please, go ahead. What did he do wrong? Go ahead, mate. Go ahead. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Um, recently, in an interview with MIT AI, uh, Eric Weins Weinstein. Weinstein. Yes. Yeah. He referred to social media as uh, a virus, as a parasite. And referring to Jonathan's height work recently, um, where the rates of young women committing suicide has increased by 70%. And he directly attributes that to the influx of social media. How do we reconcile that? How can we move towards addressing this issue? I don't know that social media is a virus, but I do think that there are parts of social media where very virulent ideologies are allowed to flourish. And it's not even about partisan ideologies. Bullying happens in these online spaces and all sorts of really abhorrent behavior. And then people extrapolate it to be something that's also happening in the world at large. Sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. But I think when it comes to young women and young men and how they're dealing with social media, I think a lot of it is that we need to encourage more media literacy. So we're talking to young people about what it means to engage online and what the repercussions of engaging online are. And parents also have to monitor, like check out what's happening. I think a lot of times people think that they can step away and let their children have freedom, but I, I don't think that's the answer. I think that parents have to be really vigilant because children are exposed to all kinds of things on the internet that they need help contextualizing. I would just say it's, it, 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 I think we are realizing that we are now in this world of social media and it, in its early days, so we don't yet know the long-term psychological effects on us all. I mean, half the time I feel like I'm on Twitter so much it's addled my brain and I took a weekend off and it was restorative <laughs> and I'm going to try to do it more. But the power, just psychologically as human beings, um, you, you're on the net and you sort of feel connected to everyone who, who's on there. You feel like, and you, you kind of watch the reaction. But if, if it turns on you, you know, if suddenly you say something and then there's, there's a mobbing and psychologically, we're, we're sort of wired to, to be, live in, you know, villages, you know, where you know about a hundred people. And now we're, the whole world is out there, people reacting and the psychological impact and I'm an adult on it, but I'm thinking of my ninth grade self or eighth grade self and, and the, the way that it can uh, you know, leverage meanness and cruelty and all that. So we may look back with uh, horror at ha this world that we are in now where we don't have protections and, and uh, warn uh, you know, one another about what what it can be doing to us, and uh, and socially, and it brings out a lot of ugliness in people of, of going after and shaming and mobbing. And I've tried to make a new rule to be as nice as I can on Twitter, and I, I'm trying not to like if somebody says something, I used to like tweet above it and say, "Ha, you know." I mean, never that mean, but I'm trying not to do that. And maybe we will evolve uh, an etiquette, and so people <laughs> will just, you know be um, considered persona non grata if they are too vicious or uh, rude. And, but we're not there yet. Long way away. Next question, please. Um, hi. My question is primarily for you, Roxanne. Um, sorry, I'm a bit nervous. Um, I, sort of, I grew up in sort of a more rural, white, sort of not white, but less diverse area of Australia. Um, and being the only person of color in predominantly white spaces, I've experienced a lot of comments, sort of quite racially insensitive, 
comparing my hair to a gollywog or sort of hosting African themed parties or such. And I've always had difficulty navigating these conversations and being the only person of color in the room, the burden falls on, falls on me to sort of speak up and sort of, sort of point out sort of the racially insensitive things being said, but how do I point that out when I know that I'm gonna be constantly shut down as my prior experience have indicated, indicated sorry, um, that that will happen? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> you know, I'm from Omaha, Nebraska, which is a very rural place in the middle of the United States, and we were the only black family in the neighborhood growing up. I've always been in predominantly white areas and attended predominantly white institutions, and so I absolutely understand that feeling of having to be the spokesperson for your race and having people always expect that of you and having to do a level of education that is really unreasonable because you probably have a job. And then you have this secondary job of educating people and calling them out. And so one of the things that, especially as I've gotten older, what I tell people who ask me this question is that you really do have to pick your battles because you also have to preserve your sanity. And the reality is that you can't spend your whole life calling every single instance of frustration or microaggression out. Otherwise, that's all you're going to do. But you have to decide for yourself, what are the stands that I'm going to take? What are the things that I truly am not going to be able to tolerate? And for me, that's the metric I use for when I call people out. And I don't really take any pleasure in it because it's exhausting. And especially when it's my friends, my family, my community, where I have to call them out on this kind of things. Like, I don't want that responsibility. I don't want to be this person who has to point out to you that, no, you can't dress in blackface. Um, but you put me in that position. And so in addition to picking my battles, I also point it out to them sort of like, what did you think was going to happen here? And try to turn it on them a little bit and make them have to engage and at least acknowledge the wrongdoing that they've done. Um, and the other thing is to just surround yourself with the right kinds of people, which is not to say you're going to find flawless people. That's never the goal. But you want to make sure you have a support network that you can turn to when these things happen so that when you're just like, I cannot take this for one second longer, you have a, a soft place to land. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hi. Um, I was really intrigued by Christine's comment that uh, capitalism is economic freedom. Yeah. Um, I just want to ask, like, do you think that like, capitalism is antithetical to the causes of feminism? And Dr. Gay, I'd be really interested in hearing your thoughts about how you can live as a feminist and still participate in the structures of like, capitalism as we all do. Yeah. Um. <laughs> You know, that's a really good question. And the reality, it's hard because money is great. It is. And frankly, the tax man doesn't care about feminism and an a resistance to late capitalism. And so I just try to make the most ethical choices that I can with my money at all times. I do have a staff at this point in my career and I pay them ethically. I give them benefits and things like that so that I make sure that I am... Being a, I am a capitalist, and I know that's one of the primary critiques against me, and I think it's a fair critique, absolutely. Um, but I just try to do it as ethically as possible. Well, I will defend you being a capitalist because, uh, first of all, capitalism freed women. Uh, it, it was, it, it, it was. Come on, like, It was in. It, where you have. It, you it have freed to white have, women. Capitalism made enslaved black women. Black women were considered property. Like, capitalism. Uh, excuse me, pre capitalist societies were good at oppression and enslavement. Slavery was 150, 200 years ago. That's not pre capitalist. That's no, post capitalist. Uh, 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 there have been slaves since the beginning of time. There have been, there's been slavery. And capitalism and bourgeois liberal society. What is notable about it is that it began the process to eliminate slavery and to eliminate seg uh, gender segregation. So you needed, it provided the prosperity to be a foundation for human emancipation. 
And, and how you don't appreciate that, I mean, what, what are you comparing it with? Capitalism was the very thing that kept slavery going as long as it did, because people were unwilling to pick their own cotton. There's, there's slavery in the world today. There's slavery. In, and capitalism, capitalism is responsible for that as well. No. All right. I mean, all right. I don't know. Okay. Wait, I and show, so, uh, will you show me a country where they are not, where they're, what country, Venezuela? Is it Cuba? Where, where is a successful society outside the market system? It's not perfect, but the free market system, as they say, is uh, the worst of all systems, except for all the rest. Hmm. <laughs> no. Okay. You wouldn't so, want to go to those other places. We've, come, we've gone over time. I just want to say, I just want to say, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that we are going to end the night. I, we, we have provided some information. We've had. Uh, we've, we've been <laughs> and I think you, he asked good questions. So I want to thank our host, Dash. <laughs> and <laughs> thank you. See, I, I feel as we've somewhat lost the art of conversation and the whole purpose of this event and uh, things I've done in the past is to bring conversation to real life, take it away from just social media, the 280 characters, etc. So uh, I want to say thank you very much for attending tonight and thank you so very much for coming today. Please give a big <laughs> warm thank you to our panelists. Thank you.